I was able to create a chart by my theoretical schemes and uh, noticed there were holes in the chart and predicted the existence of the particles to fill up the chart. And that, that those all worked. But then the question was, was there some subunit out of which all of these particles were made, these strongly interacting particles? And, uh, well, I tried it, and it came out that you could do it with uh, a certain set of particles in a quite economical way, but they would have to have electric charges plus two-thirds and minus a third. And, of course, all known particles had integral charges in units of the proton or electron charge. The proton is called plus one. The electron is called minus one. And all the known particles had charges of plus one or minus one or possibly plus two or minus two and so on. And nothing had a fractional charge in those units. But these f subunits that were most, for, that would give the most economical scheme for making what we saw out of hidden subunits, these subunits would have charges plus two-thirds and minus a third, and I was initially discouraged about that. Then I made a visit to Columbia University, and a colleague there, Bob Serber, asked me uh, whether I had ever considered this economical way of, of making subunits, considering what we then called a triplet. And I said, yes, I have considered it, but they come out to have fractional charges. And I showed him the fractional charges on a napkin at the uh, faculty club at Columbia, where we were having lunch. And, uh, and then thinking about it during the rest of the day, it occurred to me that if they were completely hidden, these particles, if they never came out, but they were permanently trapped inside the known particles, then it wouldn't cause any uh, difficulty, any uh, disagreement with observation or with any fundamental theoretical idea. And so I began to put it forward. And my attitude has been misunderstood all these years, and there are zillions of books which describe the history of this and could describe it quite incorrectly. And in fact, the Nobel Foundation, in, in awarding very, uh, the, the uh, physics prize this year to three experimental colleagues who richly deserved it, my very good friend Dick Taylor and uh, my friends uh, Henry Kendall and Jerry Friedman, uh, in awarding it, they mentioned that before the experiment, people thought of quarks as merely mathematical. Now, that's true. But what I meant by mathematical was that they were perfectly real, but trapped inside the neutron and proton and the other observable, strongly interacting particles, which was correct, completely correct. And other people, after the quark idea was put forward, came up with the notion that maybe they were directly observable. And that was wrong. But for some reason, the history has twisted it around so as to make my statements about mathematical character of quarks, which I believe from the first day that they wouldn't come out. Uh, they've twisted it into a statement that they weren't really there, that I thought they weren't really there, which is not the case at all. It's a very strange perversion of a fact that, that makes its way into history sometimes, and this is one of those cases. And, and it's true everywhere. And I've tried very often with authors of lots of accounts, books and papers and articles and so on, to explain to them the situation. It never, it never does any good. <laughs> so my being right has been converted into some kind of crime by history. Isn't that strange? I find that particular aspect frustrating. I mean, it's nice to be credited with the quarks and uh, have the Swedish Foundation refer to my work in awarding the prize to these three wonderful experimentalists who uh, confirmed the existence of quarks and inside the proton. I was delighted with all of that, but I was not delighted with this funny interpretation. Actually, the Nobel Foundation didn't, uh, didn't say it, didn't, didn't actually state the thing wrong. But the implication was that, uh, that by calling them mathematical, I was sort of denying their existence. What I meant by mathematical was that they wouldn't come out and be seen individually and directly in the laboratory. And that's turned out to be so. They are permanently trapped inside. We didn't understand, of course, back in 1963, I didn't understand why they are permanently trapped inside. But later on, when we formulated the dynamical theory, quantum chromodynamics, then we began to realize what was going on. I had the sound quark, but it could have been spelled differently. For example, K-W-O-R-K or something like that. I thought it was a nice sound. 
and didn't mean anything, I thought. And that was, good. that was good because when we give fancy Greek names to things, and of course I can do that, uh, but when we give fancy Greek names to things, they usually, it usually turns out that what they mean uh, later uh, is not so appropriate as we thought at first. Uh, the protod, for example, the first thing it means, fundamental. Well, it turns out it's not fundamental. <laughs> so, the name proton is very learned, but uh, it turned out not to be apt. Now, a quark, if it didn't mean anything at all, was not going to be obsolete ever. So, anyway, that was fine. That was the, the sound. But then, leafing through uh, James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, as I sometimes do, it's a copy my brother bought, actually, when it first came out in the United States in 1939. And uh, leafing through it, I saw the, uh, the, the phrase, uh, three quarks for Muster Mark. And I thought that would be very good. And uh, so I spelled it Q-U-A-R-K. Now, Joyce undoubtedly meant it to be pronounced quark because it goes with bark and hark and mark and so on. But, um, but I figured out a rationale for pronouncing it quark, which is that in three quarks for Muster Mark, of course, there's multiple determination of the word, as in many other cases in Finnegan's Wake. And what I figured was that one source out of the multiple, of the many determinants of the word, one source was perhaps the fact that the dreamer, uh, whose dream the book is, is Humphrey Chimpton Earwicker, who's a barman, who's a publican, he owns a bar. And uh, frequently through the book you hear people giving orders for drinks at the bar, drinks to take away and so on. So this one of the determinants of three quarks for Muster Mar could be three quarts for so-and-so, uh, an order to the bar. And I still think that may be true, although there are many other more important factors that have gone into the phrase. Uh, anyway, that allowed me to interpret that maybe it was pronounced quark instead of quark. But uh, the commentators on, on uh, Finnegan's Wake think that, and I think correctly, that, that the main thing it refers to is three cries of the four gulls that are following the ship on which Tristan and Isild are uh, traveling. Uh, and they're making fun of King Mark because uh, Tristan and Isolde are having a love affair. And uh, those four gulls occur throughout the book as four evangelists, four old men in the park, uh, and so on and so forth, four commentators of various kinds. And in this case, they're four gulls following his ship. And quark is listed in the dictionary as the cry of a gull. So that's undoubtedly the primary determinant. But maybe three quarts for so-and-so has a slight connection with it as well. And that would justify pronouncing it quark instead of quark. Initially, a lot of things I did were not taken very seriously. And, uh, but then finally, people realized that they were right. Quark certainly wasn't taken seriously by most people no. for quite a while. No, for many years it wasn't regarded as some crazy thing. And people, as I said, misunderstood what I meant by saying that I thought they were mathematical. They thought I was going back on the original idea and saying they weren't true, whereas what I meant was that they were stuck inside permanently, which we finally found to be true, and we finally understood more or less why, why it's true. Uh, but then, later on, people began accepting all sorts of very tentative ideas of mine as important and working on them, and that was sort of embarrassing. I would put forward some not very serious idea, just as a passing remark, and lots of people would start working on it. So, sort of the opposite effect. Many of the best things I did were not treated, were not received very well at first, but I think that's fairly common. People don't like to change their ideas. They're very comfortable staying in the same basin of attraction. Needs a lot of noise to shake them out of one basin of attraction into another. That's how you get a good new idea, is by shake, being shaken somehow into a, into a new basin of attraction. And uh, usually it happens uh, spontaneously, as you know. You fill yourself up with the problem, and then 
can't make any further progress by conscious effort, but sometime at some odd moment, uh, when you're doing something else, uh, thinking about something else, the idea comes to you. And people have asked the question, uh, can't you perhaps accelerate that process, artificially uh, induce uh, the movement into another basin of attraction so that you can try a different idea? And it's possible you can, by some sort of random noise. Various suggestions have been made about how to do that. Maybe there is a way to jumpstart that process, yes, to accelerate the getting of uh, correct creative ideas, useful creative ideas. But in any case, the process, the, the normal uh, spontaneous process, is apparently common to a great many fields. Uh, Psychologists have noted that, uh, artists and scientists and others have written it down, and we discovered it independently at a seminar in Aspen in 1969 where we had painters and poets and theoretical physicists and a, a theoretical biologist all talking about our experiences of getting useful ideas, and they were all just about the same, and they all followed that same pattern. Helmholtz wrote about it a hundred years ago, or more, more than a hundred years ago, and he called the phases saturation, where you fill yourself up with the problem but can't solve it. Incubation, the problem is hidden away and something deep inside you is working on it, some mental process out of awareness in what the shrinks would call the pre-conscious mind is, is working on it. And then illumination, when suddenly a good idea breaks through. And then Poincaré described this process also and he described the fourth rather trivial stage, which is verification, checking to see that the idea actually works.